the land that they have stolen, they're still fighting with each other over it. Such is what greed causes. Another story. This woman lived with her mother. The house, the husband had died a few years earlier, there had been a divorce in the family and a rift. There were four children all together, but the daughter happened to be living with the mother, and the daughter owned half of the house, and the mother owned the other half. Well, the mother began to suffer from dementia. Sooner or later, the daughter thought, I can take advantage of this, and so manipulated her mother to sign a document that the mother thought was just one medical paper or something like that, that she was going to do, and that her daughter was doing to look after her. So the mother unknowingly signs over the rest of the house to her daughter. Now that the daughter had full possession of the house, what do you think the daughter did? Kicked her out. Now, who can do that to her mother or his mother? But she did. Thankfully, later on, the siblings found out and it was a court battle and thousands of dollars later and the judge had the good sense to, in fact, award the house back to, or the other half of the house, back to the mother. But this is what unbridled, uncontrolled greed and love for material things can and does cause. Admittedly, they are horror stories. But I'm sure all of you, or just about all of you, would have your own stories of people that you've seen who've been ripped off or ripped others off because of material things. So what causes, what causes a human being to want to downgrade someone in their own family because of a material gain? That is why avarice or greed is one of the seven deadly sins. The story in the Gospel seems pretty tame by comparison, but let me just explain a little bit about how inheritance was divided amongst the children in the time of Christ. I'm not sure if this is still the practice amongst Jews today, but it certainly was in the time of Christ and before that. If there were, for instance, three children in the family, and parents, whatever, left some property, a field or a house, or whatever, <coughs> that house or field or whatever it was, wasn't divided by three equal shares. It was divided by four, always one more than the number of children. And the eldest son or daughter would get double share, and then the rest would get a share. So what happened here is the brother obviously got his extra share, and he was helping himself to some more, the share of his brother, the younger brother, and now he cries out to Jesus and says, listen, can you tell my brother to be fair and just? At one level, it sounds as though Jesus is not actually interested in the man's problem, but actually he is very interested, but he doesn't want to get lost in all the red tape. So he warns all of his listeners about the danger of avarice of any kind, not just the worst kind, but of any kind. St. Paul calls greed the equivalent of idolatry, having a false god. When we look around our own society, things haven't changed, have they? I mean, so many people live to get more, whether they've got to get a different, a greater house, or a boat, or another car, or this property, or that. Oh, you know, to have some security. Fine, okay, that's all good. But what is also going on deep down? Is the heart actually getting tied up with these things, whereas perhaps it should be strengthening the bonds with the man upstairs? knowing that ultimately all the good that comes to us comes to us as a result of his love upon us. Yes, sure, our own hard work, opportune moments that we take advantage of, but ultimately it comes to us from the hands of God, if it comes to us honestly. 
If on the other hand, we've done some wheeling and dealing, that's not coming from the hands of God. God is permitting those things. And we show that in fact our hearts are not upright. So how do we know when these stories I gave are more extreme examples? But they do happen, sadly. How do I know if I am tempted to greed? If I really want, and just to define it, greed as I'm using it, is that wish or desire to want more than I genuinely need. The wish or desire to want more, to have more than I truly need in order to live reasonably as a citizen in our own times. Unfortunately, what often happens, and this is the trickery of our minds, is that we turn <coughs> wants into needs. I want the extra car, I want a boat, I want some property, I want the extra holiday, I want, I want, I want, but I can't talk about I want, I want, I want. So I have to rationalize and convince myself, I need this. I need it. This is good for me. My life would be better if I have this. Has anyone heard anyone talk like that before? Only two hands, I don't believe you. I, I said, has anyone heard anyone say that? I'm not referring to you. God forbid that it could touch my own life, you know? But this is the sad reality. Turning wants into needs. It's a trickery. How also can I tell if I am greedy or at least disordered in my attachment? to material things. Well, a very simple rule of thumb. How easy do I find it to share my goods and my belongings with others? Here's a question to ask ourselves. How easy do I find it to share my wealth with others? My generosity of spirit. I'm not just talking here about, you know, the ten dollars you put on the plate or something like that. No. Someone who needs help. Am I ready to put my hand in my pocket? Not just to give a hand up, but somebody who is in need. And being pretty sure that I'm not going to get it back. Because it's easier to give when I know I'm going to get it back. To let someone use my property, my belongings, whatever it happens to be. This question can be very indicative about what's going on inside of us, even at a subconscious level. A fellow I met when I was working in America, he used to be a, a Protestant evangelical minister for a number of years, and then he uh, rediscovered his Catholic faith and came back to the fold, uh, very fervent. And he said to me, Father, I learned one of the lessons when I was in the Protestant evangelical scene, to keep an open hand at policy. He said, what do you mean by that? He says, if I have an open hand, somebody can take from my hand, but my hand is also open to continue receiving. And if we do understand that ultimately our blessings, spiritual and material, come from God, who owns all the gold, then I must keep an open-handed policy. If on the other hand, I have a closed-hand policy, then yes, my goods, my money, my belongings will once slip out of my hand, but neither will I be able to receive more. One of the lessons that I've certainly seen in my life is when the Lord has put it on my heart to give some money or help someone out in some way, typically I get back double. Usually in a different currency, sometimes in the same currency, and it comes from a different person. I'll give some money to somebody, and out of the blue, a week later, somebody will give me exactly the same amount, or double that amount. And I'm thinking, who's really pulling the strings here? One story I'll share with you, and then I'll finish, is this. 
It happened when I was 32. I was about to go to World Youth Day in, uh, in Toronto, uh, 2002. And it was the Monday. I was about to fly out on the following Sunday. And I'm having a wheeze to God in my prayer. And I was saying, I had about $200 left in my bank account. And I'm thinking, I'm taking a group of young adults from our diocese. And I haven't got a bit of spare money to buy them a cup of coffee or a lunch or whatever while we're over at World Youth Day. So I was sulking and having a whinge. Yes, I do sulk sometimes, okay? I don't like to admit it, but I do. And anyway, that afternoon, I get a phone call from a funeral director in the area. And there was a stipend attached to that funeral that I had to do later that week. That afternoon or the following day, another funeral came in. There was another stipend attached to that funeral. And then on the Sunday, I had breakfast with some friends of mine. And they knew I was going overseas on pilgrimage. So they gave me a pile of money to spend with the young people over there. And then that afternoon, I was doing some work with somebody. And they gave me more money as well. So I got home and I'm thinking, where did all this cash come from? At that moment, I heard the words inside of me, put me and my kingdom first, and all these other things will be given to you. I felt that big, because I realized I was not trusting in God's providential care for me. Do we believe God is our Father? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Do we believe He cares for us? Yes. yes. Do we believe that he loves us? Yes. Then do we believe he provides for us? Yes. Well, I didn't at that moment. I didn't. And I was sorry, and I repented, and I said, I'm sorry, Lord, that I didn't trust you, that you will come good. And now I have more money at the end of that week that I knew what to do with. So God provides for us. Let our treasure be in him. And God knows what we really need. And he will give us for what we need. But he won't give us what we want. And that is an important distinction we have to keep in mind. But if our treasure is in material things, believe you me, they will always, always, always let us down. But if our treasure is in God, then not only will he never let us down, but he will reward us handsomely in eternity. I had a funeral two days ago, and the woman I was burying, there was a stack of trophies of accomplishment in her life, accomplishments. And I said to the congregation gathered, what do you think is the great inheritance that this woman has left behind? Is it all these achievements or political dignitaries there? I said, no. It's the self-sacrifices that she had made for members of her family so that they could get an education, they could have a break in their lives that she didn't have. And she wanted to see them flourish. This is the kind of treasure that Christ is asking us to build up. The treasure that can never be destroyed or taken away by any thief. A treasure that is held up in our life with Christ in God.